I'm so delighted to see your happy faces, even though it's just half, but uh, we're looking forward to the day that uh, we could go back to uh, the normalcy where we left off uh, when the COVID came. God is good, amen? amen. Uh, we cannot just be silent on the goodness of God that uh, we receive even at this pandemic. Amen. Um, I, I just uh, kind of want to shout and say hallelujah every single morning. So um, I'd like to share with you this um, subject, a breaking point. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Father in heaven, as we now come to the study of your word, we humbly ask that you will send the Holy Spirit to teach us. It is only through you, O oh God, that we can comprehend the message that you want us to take at these worship services. And thank you again for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. A group of botanists went on an expedition to a hard-to-reach location in the Alps, searching for new varieties of flowers. One day, a scientist looked through his binoculars. He saw a beautiful, rare species growing at the bottom of that deep ravine. To reach it, someone would have been lowered into that gorge. Noticing a, 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 a local youngster standing nearby, the man asked him if he would help them to get that flower. The boy was told that the rope would be tied around his waist. And the man would then lower him to the floor of the canyon. Excited yet apprehensive about the adventure, the youngster peered thoughtfully into the deep gorge and said, wait, I'll be back and off he ran. When he returned, he was accompanied by an older man approaching the head botanist, the boy said, I'll go over to the cliff now and get the flower for you. But this man must hold on to the rope. But who is he? Asked the botanist. And the boy said, he is my dad. The boy just had the confidence and listened to say he is a very smart boy. He basically knew whom he can trust to hold securely the rope before agreeing to jump off the cliff. You know, years ago, the home was a refuge of security. Down through the centuries, it has been a heaven of stability. The home was a place people could flee from the troubles and difficulties of life. Enter the doors of your home and you will feel secure. Warm loving embraces and hugs produce a sense of well-being. Home has just been the traditional place of family togetherness. But the home has changed in the last 20 years. 21st century homes are often a battlefield. Now words like abuse, conflict, anger, and hostility are 
a common place when describing a home. We read about families who spend very little time at home, children eating on the run. At best, they rush home for a meal before they leave again. The home has become simply a place to eat and sleep. Both, with both parents working, in many instances, thousands of children are left to raise themselves with TV dinners and microwaves. We read about fragmented families. The number of single parents is growing. The structure of the home is different today. And this is particularly accentuated at this time of COVID pandemic. The number of people working at home has grown by the thousands. And millions do most of their shoppings online. The real question is, how will family values survive in the first or 21st century, I would say? We are now almost a quarter past of the 21st century. How is it in your home? Are there any things different? Or what remains the same? Many parents are seriously concerned about what is coming into their home via internet. Through television and the internet, excessive violence, sex, and total lack of decency and morals have invaded our homes. Why is there an escalating amount of violence, immorality, and greed in our society? It seems more people are being motivated by hate. Hate groups are publishing their distorted propaganda publicly on their web pages. You hear or read news that even in broad daylight, elderly are being attacked because of their race. Our young people are so confused of their identities and their concept of the sanctity of marriage had been changed tremendously. Would you agree, therefore, that without moral standards, we are thrown into a state of confusion or social chaos? Where are we headed? Is morality a matter of personal definition? Moral standards, which were once rock solid, are now non-existent. Our children are exposed to various versions of right and wrong. There are a competing values for the minds of our children. Let's look at the facts about television and internet. The average 18-year-old has witnessed, check this out, ha has witnessed 200,000 violent acts on television and movies, including 40,000 murders. Many violent acts are caused by the good guys or heroes whom kids are taught to admire. You might be wondering, does the form of entertainment we watch make any difference in our thinking process? Research reveals that the reality of biblical truth by beholding we what? Become changed. When you watch 40,000 
murders. Your mind becomes anesthetized toward murder. When you see 200,000 violent acts on television, the message you receive is that violence is okay. When you play cutting or shooting someone in video games, you are instilling aggressive habits and behavior. When you fill your mind with immorality, the message would be that immorality is acceptable. So is it any wonder why is it that we had such high rates of crime? Why violence is so commonplace? Why marriages are breaking up at alarming numbers? The Bible penetrates the very reason why crime is exploding. Our society has turned back on God's moral standards. It has passed off God's standard. So how do you protect moral values in an immoral world? How can you protect your mind? How can you protect the minds of your children, your grandchildren? The last book of the Bible the book of Revelation has a message for the last generation of men and women living on this planet Earth. This message is an urgent for us to understand in our days as Noah's message was in his day. It's a final message for all humanity. Revelation 14 verse 7 again says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Amen. Fear God does not mean to be afraid of God. It means reverence, respect, and obey God. Give glory to Him is a call to give glory to God in your lifestyle. This passage in the book of Revelation answers the question of moral responsibility. Why is there so much crime and violence in this society? Why is there so much immorality? Why is there so much lawlessness? It revolves around the issue of moral responsibility. The judgment calls us to accountability for our actions. Judgment implies responsibility and moral choices. If I'm not responsible for what I do, how can God's judgment hold me accountable for those actions? Like saying, if I am an alcoholic because my father was an alcoholic and my grandfather was an alcoholic, then I'm not responsible. Like if I'm a drug addict because I was abused as a child, then I'm not responsible. Like if I'm a criminal because my genetics Make me that way. I'm not responsible. The society we live is a society that largely say you are not responsible for your actions. It also declares right and wrong is something every person determines in their own mind. The idea is, I am not responsible, or I'm sorry, I'm only responsible to myself. I'm not responsible 
to a higher God. When you take that position, you are not responsible to a higher power and that there is no judgment. There are, in reality, no certain moral standards to guide your life. Judgment implies responsibility and moral choices. In the last days of Earth's history, God is calling men and women to judgment. Does God have a standard of morality and a basis? For his final judgment? He does. God's law is the basis of morality and standard of judgment. The book of Revelation says you are responsible for your actions. For the hour of his judgment has come. The book of Revelation calls us back to the law of God, which is God's moral standard. James put it this way in James chapter 2 and verse 12. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Amen. The entire law of God is a law of liberty. Here are few examples. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Preserve the sanctity of life. So it, 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 it frees us from harms and danger. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, preserves the sanctity of the family. So it protects the institution of marriage and the family. The eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal protects our possession and our property. Think of the chaos in society if the principles of God's law were openly disregarded. Echoing from the book of Revelation, is God called to keep his law? Judgment and law are part of the gospel. But someone says, I thought we were saved by grace and we didn't need to keep God's law. Look, if God could have changed his law, Jesus would not have had to die. And the Bible says, the wages of sin is what? Is death. The wages of sin is that if God's law was changed, why would Jesus have to die? Because we broke God's law. When Christ was crucified on the cross, he was judged as a sinner dying to pardon our sins. Why would God send his son to suffer that cruel death? If all he had to do with some stroke of a magic was change his law. The law and judgment are all part of the gospel of Christ. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. God's law is his eternal moral standard, which defines sin and establishes our accountability to God. His law defines what morality is, even in your mind. Does not say so. The book of Revelation says the foundation of God's throne is God's law. The moral law of God's protect us. God's law is not some arbitrary regulation to restrict our happiness. 
God's law is the pathway to freedom and genuine happiness. God's law protects us from a lifestyle which would destroy us. Some Christians have been even said, we don't preach on the law in our church. We preach about His love as if there are two different things. Love always leads to obedience. Love doesn't lead you to disobedience. It leads you to keep God's commandments. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you keep my commandments. Does Jesus say, If you love me, you don't have to keep my commandments? No. Love's response is to keep God's commandments. The reason we, we obey is not because we're trying to earn God's favor. It's the response of our love for Him. I do not obey God to earn my salvation. All my obedience does not earn salvation. Christ wrote that out on the cross. But when I come to the cross, my obedience is evidence that I'm saved. Look what 1st John 2 verses 3 and 4 it says now by this you know that we know him if we keep his commandments. John says here is the evidence that we know God. Here is the evidence that we are born again believers and in verse 4 it says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandment is a liar and the truth is not in him. Grace and law are, contra are not contradictory ideas. When you are saved by grace, you are not saved to disobey. You are saved to obey. What is the role of God's law? First, all salvation is by grace. Old Testament believers look forward to a Christ who would come in the New Testament. We look Christ who has come. We are saved by the grace to come. We are saved by a grace that has come but if it's all by grace what is the role of God's law then let's go to Romans 3 and verse 20 it says by the law it is the knowledge of sin by the law it is the knowledge of sin God reveals sin through his law Paul says in Romans 7 and verse 7, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. If you break God's law, it is sin. So the law, of the law is to define sin. The law says, this is right and this is wrong. The law defines the moral standard of God's judgment. The law defines the foundation of all society. The judgment in Revelation calls men and women wherever back to law keeping. It calls Christians that are saved by grace to live obedient, righteous, holy lives. So then, what is the role of grace? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Grace 
is God's mercy. Grace is God's pardon. Grace is God's forgiveness. Grace is God's love. Reaching out to sinners like you and me. Does grace do away with God's law? If I am saved by grace, does that lead me to break God's law? What did Romans 3.31 says? It's very clear. It says, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Paul says, don't think we do away with the law by faith through grace. We establish it. We keep it. People who are saved by grace are obedient. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Jesus didn't come. To do, to do away with the law. He was the living law. And Jesus himself obeyed the law. He fulfilled it. And in Romans 6.14 it says. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law but under grace. When does sin have dominion over you? When you follow your own way rather than God's way. What does it mean to be under the law? It means to be under the condemnation of the law because I broke it. I'm condemned by the law. I broke it so I'm under the law. What does it mean to be under grace? To be under grace, I come to, cro to the cross. I kneel at the feet of the cross. To be under grace means that I accept Christ's pardon, receive Christ's forgiveness, and I am filled with his power. Christ writes his law in my heart and in my mind, and I desire to obey him. When a student deserves to have a great F, by failing the test. But instead he was given the chance to retake the test. He is under the law of the grading system to get an F. But then he was given grace to retake the test. Should he then not go back and study harder? So he could get a passing grade? The Bible is very clear on this subject. When we come to Jesus and throw ourselves at his feet, he says, my child, no matter how simple your life has been in the past, my child, I will forgive you. And you can begin again. The law reveals our need when I look at God's law. I see who I am. I don't measure up to that law. When I come to Jesus, when I look at his law, I see times when I have been impatient. I see times when I haven't been a kind as I should be. When I come to Jesus, I fall at his feet. This is what David means in Psalms 17 or 19 verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. That perfect law drives me to Jesus to confess my sins, ask forgiveness and power to live the life of obedience. Somebody came to Jesus once. And tried to trick him. And this is recorded in Matthew 22 verses 36 
to 39. A lawyer came and asked, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love you, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is, You shall love your neighbor ask yourself what was Jesus doing he was summarizing the Ten Commandments because Jesus said in verse 40 on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets the entire law can be summarized in one word four letters love love God and your fellow men The first four commandments with love to God and the six commandments with love to our fellow men. Jesus was saying, if you love fully, you will love God. If you love fully, you will love your fellow men. Love always leads to obedience. Keeping God's law doesn't put you in bondage. It takes you out of bondage. The Ten Commandments were not given to restrict our freedom. They were given so we could be truly free. Listen to how these are introduced in Exodus 20 verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. It is the Lord God, the Lord of heaven and earth. Who wrote these commandments with his own fingers on tables of stones as a moral principles for all time. So let's review them. Exodus 20 verses 3 to 17. You shall not have no other gods before me. God is saying, I am your supreme, in your supreme life. No other gods, not your house, not your money. Not your habits, not your leisure, not your career, nothing else. Worship God only and supremely. You shall not make yourself a carved image. God says, don't come to me through images, come to me directly. You shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Love God enough to respect His name. Think of it. The name Jesus. That name at which angels veil their faces. That name at which Jesus sings, Holy, Holy, Holy. That name is being dragged to the dust with vile curses and foul languages. Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Worship the creator of heaven and earth. Worship him as the one who made you. Because the fourth commandment speaks to this generation. Honor your father and thy mother. In an age when children no longer obey their parents, when the kid says to his parents, you can tell me what to do. The fifth commandment speaks with re relevance. You shall not kill. At the time when the nuclear we weapons are being built to kill people, at a time of abortion on demand, at a time when snipers kill innocent children, there is still a commandment that says love is sacred. Thou shalt not kill. You shall not commit adultery. At the time of immorality, at the time when there is lack of moral purity, God's law speaks to this generation. 
when a society turns its back on God's law, when it is openly immoral, that society is on its way to disaster. This is a call for America and the world to come back to God's law. You shall not steal. It's still wrong to steal. It is still wrong to shoplift even if you're hungry. It's still wrong to take something that does not belong to you. You shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Lying is still wrong. Gossip is still wrong. Dragging someone's good name through the dust is still wrong. Commandment number 10, you shall not covet. Still has very much relevance to our society today. Coveting someone's possession or position often times lead you to more grievous transgression of other commandments. All these Ten Commandments speak to this generation. They stand fast forever and ever. Satan lost heaven because of disobedience. Adam and Eve lost Eden because of disobedience. God is calling his people to his Ten Commandments. Do you want your children to grow in the whole knowledge and obedience to God's law? And increase your success in raising children from the Lord amidst the rampant technological influence and distractions? Then let's follow God's instructions on how we can do it in Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9, which was our scripture reading. It says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the byway, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. If God's law is in our minds, we know that we have respect on God. If God's law is in our hearts, we love it. God will have a last day people whose law is written in their hearts and in their minds. They will love Him through obeying Him. And the last chapter of Revelation describes God's redeemed saints this way, Revelation 22, verse 14, it says, Blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and they may enter through the gates into the city. My dear brethren, this is the message that we need to be fulfilled in our hearts in our minds not only during worship service like this it should be in our lifestyle and that's the reason why we have a lot of situation today that we cannot we cannot even imagine that is happening and the only way that we could have that right mind is to have jesus in our heart because when Jesus is in our hearts, we will delight to do His commandments. Amen. And let's make it a point, especially when our children are still with us, they need to know. I praise God when we raise Jasper, not a single day passed that we don't pray for her. Even though my wife and I are busy sometimes, but we make it a point that we still have 
family worship, whatever time allows us when we come home. And it makes a difference. It makes a difference. If there will be a time that we need to pray for our children, it is not. Don't make a day pass without praying for your children. Why? Because they were the target of the devil. And our only hope is through this world and his commandments. May the Lord bless us that we will keep this law in our hearts. May God bless us all. And before 